Well, hello everyone. I just want to begin with by saying thank you to each and every one of you for not only attending these sites today, but for coming to my speaking block. We're going to be discussing social engineering, training the human marvel, also known as our users. And as a quick introduction, my name is Rihanna Schultz. I am a University of Central Missouri alumni. I graduated, thank you. I graduated in 2018 with my bachelor's of science in cybersecurity, secure software development. I enjoyed school so much, I decided to go back, graduate again. In 2020, with my master's of science in information assurance, I have a huge extensive background in endpoint engineering, network security engineering, and as of right now, I work at a security operations center. I do a lot of volunteer work with women in STEM, and I'm a huge STEM educator with Girl Scouts of America. Besides cybersecurity, I love eating Chipotle, and I enjoy reading 1980 science fiction. Okay, cool. Third time's a charm. Thank you. <laughs> so, a few takeaways as we begin. I would like each and every one of you to keep an open mind through this presentation. We all come from different security backgrounds, whether it's 10 years of experience, maybe you are fresh out of college and you're sitting here, or if you are a college student, welcome to B-Sides. I really hope that you learn how to not only mature your security education fishing awareness program, but if security education is a new topic for your business, maybe your funding is a little low, you can benefit from this talk as well. So the previous slide, sorry, this keeps really sticking my keys. The previous slide talked about historical knowledge about some of the topics we're discussing. I did a lot of research prior to this talk. In fact, I took a pool of 100 users with the background of cybersecurity and computer science and I wanted to do a phishing assessment. I want to understand the psychological reasoning as to why are users clicking fish, regardless if security education is present or not. So how did I fish them? I took three different campaigns. Each campaign had a specific type of threat. We used fishing in a barrel, spear phishing, and spoofing. I sent two different types of fish that mimic these types of threats and I made it into a measurable, quantifiable data by creating my own algorithm. By taking all of the fishing characteristics that these fish have, I gave it a severity rating. This severity rating reflected the probability of the likelihood of how a user is going to spot a fish. So the more characteristics a fish has, the higher the score is, the most likely a user will be able to spot a fish. And for us to understand how to fish users, fun fact, we have to know our users. There is a word called user architecture. We know security and we perform security defenses by knowing network defense architecture and security architecture. And this identifies how our assets and how our defenses work on our, on our business network. Why are our users not part of these defenses? Defense in depth, we talk about all of these different layers of defense models. Our users are going to be that last defense model. So we have to count as this being part of that architecture mindset. For us to understand user architecture, we have to know user mindset and user behaviors. User mindset is going to really reflect how we do security. Security is also a type of mindset. For example, you might hear this frequently. Phishing education is important. We, per, we provide leadership metric maybe once a month quarterly to show how our security assessment is working. One to two percent leadership might be like, yeah, our users are not interacting with our phishing program. This means it's working. But in reality, we have a user and he knows for a fact that phishing happens the second week of the month and the company might provide incentives for reporting a fish, such as providing swag items. Maybe the company sends out a huge email and has a wall of honor for the users that reported fish six times in a row this year. So this user understands there's initiatives and security sends a fish out second week of the month. This user received an email and then this user looks over to their coworker who has also received this exact same email. The user goes, cool, this is my fish. So they're gonna report to security to get that notification that says congrats. You reported a phishing assessment. So this user who is so friendly, so great, they're gonna screenshot that email and blast it in Slack or Teams and let everyone else know in their department that, hey, this is the fish of the month. You too can get swag for participating. But what does leadership see? That one 
22% click rate. Then we also have a different mindset. We have annual education refreshers are important. Yes, we do provide fishing education, but annual refreshers such as videos might also be beneficial. Why? Because people learn different. They educate themselves different. So some people are visual rather than hands-on. What's your day-to-day -day user going to do? Oh my gosh, it's another video. I have to watch that's mandated. So they're going to play this video in the background, and they're going to continue on their day-to-day. -day. What's our users learning here? It's not fishing education. It's how our environment works, how a business is working in the environment. So, user architecture, we have user mindset, how are users think? What about know thy audience? There is a saying in this industry, it's called know thy network. Know how assets work on your network, um, identify rogue assets, the net flow, how the topologies work. Our users, again, are a different type of architecture. Know thy audience is understanding how our users behave in an organization. So, we have Dave, Dave works in finance. Dave was a great guy, great employee, shows up to work nine to five every day. Um, once in a while he's sick, but we'll let Dave be Dave. Dave has a lot of emails. He specifically works with maybe 401k services. He might work with benefits, payroll. Then we have Steve. Steve works in sales. Steve works with maybe account managers, customers, other vendors, or third party services. Dave and Steve work at the same company, and they got hit with a phishing campaign made it through their email security because it's a new type of threat. And this email security vendor hasn't provided a day's signatures yet. So this email makes it down to Dave and Steve. And the email contents specifically state, it's time for you to update your benefits. You have a time frame to do this, otherwise we're gonna automatically unroll you. And when they click on that link, it might be credential harvesting. So, Dave, who works very frequently with benefits and 401k services, probably has a higher probability knowing that this is a phishing threat. Steve, who works in sales and probably doesn't know much about benefits, he's that day-to-day -day user that just enrolls, and when he gets that email from HR, then that's when he has a you know, reminder throughout the year. So what's the likelihood that Steve is going to be recording this email? So we have to understand how our users behave. We have to know how their email traffic looks, because each user has a different behavior with their organization. So security education software, it is expensive. It is so expensive. And I always make the joke, you have to probably sell your plasma to be able to afford a good security education program. In fact, in 2020, Proofpoint did release um, an article stating that it was $8 a user as a subscription for their security education platform. I love Proofpoint. It's a great, mature tool. But if you are new to security education and security awareness, you're probably going to be at the bottom line of that budget totem pole, which is sad because our users are part of a defense in your business. So part of my research, which was funded by UCM, um, I didn't go on money. I couldn't afford these reputable vendors. So what did I use? Went out to Google and I was looking for good open source tools. I used a tool called Go Get Fish. Go get fish um, is great. I personally say this is something that you're looking to start and dip your toes in just to see how maybe security education looks in your environment. And what I liked about it, it had a lot of webhooks and API integrations with good SMTP server brands such as Gmail, Yahoo, Microsoft. And what I liked about it, even though it's open source, the developers were very in tune with their community. So they provided updates bug fixes, and they let their community know as well. If you are interested more about this, I do recommend uh, scanning this QR code above just so you can learn more about it. Now this is how I used it. I hosted my Go Get Fish server on a virtual Linux machine environment. In that Go Get Fish server, I was able to upload maybe email examples. I also hard coded a few of my emails by using HTML, CSS, because I had a large participant poll, I bulk uploaded 100 plus user emails to this server, and I was not manually gonna be putting one by one email in. That was just, I'm sorry, no. Uh, from there, I created an authentication API token. I created accounts on third party SMTP, such as Gmail, Yahoo, and Microsoft. And I used that API authentication token to talk from that GoGetFish server to that SMTP server. 
that SMTP server that then send out all the emails. What I like specifically about this Go Get Fish is I can dynamically send my phishing campaigns. Meaning I set a time frame from a week to a month. I scheduled my entire three campaigns I wanted and I sent it to all the users at a different time. Now, this was one of the examples. Going back to the historical knowledge, I used three different types of threats. First threat was a fish in a barrel. And if a user did click on this, they were redirected to a survey page, and the survey page goes, hey, you had an oopsie, I'm sorry, uh, no worries. But this is where you can learn about security education. In fact, here's some common phishing characteristics. I use all of these characteristics in my phishing campaign. So I was essentially giving keys to the kingdom to my users of how can you not fall for my phishing emails. So because I had an algorithm, and I wanted to measure how difficult a phish can be, my first phishing campaign had a high probability rate that a user should be able to spot this. In fact, that first fish I sent, I went through Google Translate a good four or five times and then reverted back to English, and that's what my email was. So I was really creative with it. But what made this a very high probability about both of these, uh, when hovering over those links, it was a short URL, there was generic greenies, you know, really didn't make sense, bad, bad grammar, bad just structure all together. I had people click on this. And as a security professional, specifically my audience, being those in cybersecurity and computer science, I said, oh my gosh, there was no way. And we go back to the 0% click rate. Why did they click on this? They were curious. Um, they didn't care. In fact, I had a few of the participants say they had false trust that their antivirus would prevent any threats happening on their computer. This is why your users are your last layer of defense. So, I said, all right, cool. And in fact, I had a couple that didn't even know this was a fish. So I was happy. They interacted. They're learning. That second fish I sent, there wasn't as many clicks. And me being an actor in this situation, it's kind of bumped. You know, I like people clicking my fishing emails. It's satisfying. Uh, but this did show security education is working with this type of threat. Now let's go to the second email. I targeted spear phishing. I, Every participant was a University of Central Missouri student. This was really fun. I specifically targeted these students with factors that included their day-to-day. -day. Um, the first one, I wanted to have a psychological scare with my users. I said, hey, you violated a browser policy. You were looking up inappropriate content while on the university network. You have to go register for training. There was a lot of clicks. <laughs> Fun fact, there's no policy at UCM. Um, yeah, and the feedback on this, I had a couple of very angry messages from students, and I was like, look, man, I don't care what you're doing on your computer. But the second one wasn't as scary. I wanted to have a false trust relationship with my participants. In fact, it's not uncommon, especially since we have international students, uh, we have students at state. Students will work on Google Drive as a form of collaboration with homework. And so I sent out a link. And if you're a Futurama fan, I use a couple of pop culture references, such as Philip Fry in this. Um, again, there was a lot of clicks, but there wasn't that many. And so we can see again, educating on this type of threat is working. So it's the last fish in my campaign. I use Spoofy. If you do not have a DKIM, DMARC policy on your email security filters, I really recommend that you make a note of this, you go home and you research this. Spoofing is a threat, and it is forever evolving, it's forever maturing, because our threat actors are getting smart as we are maturing our defenses as well. So I spoofed my own university address in the header, and all the participants knew this should be coming from my university address, and I gave them a gift card as a form of gratitude. Thank you for participating. Had a lot of clicks. Students love free money, apparently. Um, the second fish I sent, I felt, you know, I was like, oh, yes, hopefully I get a lot of clicks on this. I had scraped the University of Central Missouri's Office of Technology email. I scraped their headers, and in fact, this is the format that they use for a lot of their emails. I took that, used it to my own leverage, and I basically said, hey, your password's expiring, you need to reset it from here. There were a lot of clicks again. So, what can we learn from this? Well, security education, yeah, it's great. But what can we do with this data? If I was in a corporate environment 
and I did this with all the users in my organization. Leadership would say, why was this high? Are our users silly? And I'd be like, no, they are learning because this type of threat is clearly something our users are not educated on. This is something we have to evolve our users with. And if you walk into the mindset of, we constantly update our EDR, we update our blacklisting, we push patches to our systems to prevent vulnerabilities, our users are a firewall. We have to evolve our users so that way they get the same modification of education that's coming out with new types of threats. That way, us as security professionals can have starting a all sense of trust with our users. And 0% click rate, unrealistic. I'm sorry. Um, all of the survey feedbacks either had a consistency of, I was curious, at a false trust that security was going to block this threat. So having a low percent click rate doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. This shows that maybe, hey, you had a good starting point in your security education, but now it's time to mature it. One to two percent might be a low level for you, but what about having a 10 or 15 percent? This is showing that your users are being challenged to grow, and that's what we want as security professionals. We are updating our user firewall. So how do you mature your fishbowl? Well, you do not have to be creative to have good fish in your pool. Work with your security operations center. Work with maybe your service or help desk. These people are going to be your first eyes in the network. These people are going to be your ears of your network. And they're going to be seeing what is reported to them. For instance, if we're working in a SOC, and Dave from Finance started sending me a bunch of phishing emails and regarding benefits, and I see nothing from Steve, maybe I should have this in the pool because I want to train my other user behaviors to spot these types of threats as well. How many IT people actually report phish? How can we target our IT people, the ones with admin accounts and credentials? Another thing, um, read the news. Get on Twitter, um, follow some podcasts. In fact, Microsoft released two months ago an O365 fish that was targeting MFA tokens. How many of you saw that and decided to put that in your phishing campaign? Put real world threats into your phishing campaign because again, we are evolving our users to the type of threats that we are seeing day to day. These are our line, last lines of defense. So, this is my talk, and like I said, I hope you all came here with an open mind, and maybe I motivated you to make a change in your security education. Maybe um, this is a way for you to grow and evolve your user firewall as well. I'm going to leave this up for a couple more minutes because we're going to have the feedback slide. I have a question. Yeah. What's your favorite fish that you've ever seen? Oh, bang. <laughs> I really do like snooping fish. I'm going to be biased on that. Uh, just because it shows maybe gaps in my security and something I can take back and work with my other security departments as well. If there's any other questions, let me know. Yes? Um, in specific regards to snooping, um, how difficult is it to bypass like, external email things like password resets? Is, is using Slack or Teams or something like that an internal network notification better to avoid the additional emails from external sources? Yep, so each organization, so the question was, here, Joel, I'll let you say it. <laughs> so in regards to spoofing, um, how difficult is it to bypass like external notifications for things such as um, email or I mean um, password resets or things like that for internal appliances, consoles like Office 365 or something like that, and get those via Teams or Slack so that you don't ever have to get a password reset through your email. Yeah, and we go back to talking about defense and death layers. So there's a few factors you can include to harden that security. Um, you can use Slack and Microsoft, but we have seen how many times those have get hacked, how many times those have get owned as well, and if you haven't seen recent events in the news, um, it's not uncommon. So what we can do, we can educate our users of what's an authoritative source of a password reset. Maybe it's a banner. 
Um, if you're using MFA as a secondary, maybe you're using a portal to reset your admin passwords or user passwords from there, uh, rather than something like an external website. Did that kind of answer it? Cool, thanks. <laughs> Awesome, thank you so much. <laughs>